What is the difference between hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, and um, hypermobility spectrum disorder, uh, HSD? That question comes up a lot, not just in this forum, but a lot in general. Those are very artificial constructs. So backing up a step, EDS, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, is one of more than a dozen, 13 or so different types of defined genetic disorders that uh, in some way or another affect connective tissue, affect collagen. At the very base of all of these types, for the most part, people are hypermobile, meaning their joints move more than they should. To some degree, skin can be hyperextensible, extra stretchy to varying degrees. Far, far and away, so something like 90% of all cases of, of EDS that, that get encountered um, are going to be the so-called hypermobile form. So while the hypermobile form is genetic, we feel very strongly about that. It certainly seems to be what we call autosomal dominant, meaning that there is one abnormal gene and um, you only need to get that from one parent. So some diseases are dominant, meaning that if either parent carries the gene, then if a child gets that gene, then they will have it. So again, if a parent has an autosomal dominant disorder, then each kid they have would have a 50-50 chance of getting the gene that causes the disease. That's in contrast to so-called autosomal recessive disorders, where in order for an individual to have that disorder, they have to have um, two abnormal genes. So in other words, they get one from each parent. And then in those situations, the parents are what they're called carriers, meaning they're not symptomatic because they only have one abnormal gene. And then when the child has two abnormal genes. Um, so most of the EDS, with the exception of some of the more rare ones, uh, most of the forms of EDS are dominant. And, and that goes for, we think, hypermobile EDS. There could be huge variability amongst family members, which makes it hard. So it may seem like there's no family history and the parent that you got the gene from might, you know, not manifest it or um, might not have been aware of it. And by the, by the time you're symptomatic, they're older <laughs> and they may not seem to be hypermobile or they, you know, their symptoms are so mild and meager in comparison to the, those that you and other family members may have that it may seem hard to believe that, that they, they have it. So even though hypermobile EDS is felt to be genetic, right now at the present time, no one knows that there's no gene or genes that have been identified. So in contrast, the much more rare forms of EDS, by and large, there's been a gene identified at least for, for many of those cases. Um, and so right now, the only way that we can, that the only way that we do diagnose hypermobile EDS is based on so-called clinical criteria. So, and, and these are admittedly arbitrary. A group of geneticists got together in 2017 in terms of the most recent criteria we use, came up with these criteria. Um, and this is where it gets confusing. There's basically three separate questions, if you will. So the first question is, is the person hypermobile? And even that's already arbitrary and that's defined for better or for worse, based on something called the Baden scale. Uh, and that's a measure of, of, you know, can a person, how much can they bend back their pinky finger? Can they bend it back more than 90 degrees? Can they pull their thumb against their forearm? Uh, do their knees hyperextend? And basically there's a potential to get nine points or anywhere from zero to nine points on the Baden scale. Some people, most people will have some points on it. So basically, four or less for an adult is considered normal and five or more for an adult uh, is going to be abnormal. It doesn't, once you're abnormal, you don't get extra points for having more hypermobility. It's sort of, do you meet criteria or not? So that's just the question is, is this person hypermobile? So once upon a time, really anybody who is hypermobile with maybe a couple of other issues would then be considered to have had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and at the time they called it EDS type 3. Appropriately, geneticists and other people working in the field said, hey, not everyone who's hypermobile has a disease or disorder. And so they wanted to have a better way. So take this issue of, hey, somebody's hypermobile, then they have to have other features before we would say, yeah, you have a disorder, you have EDS. And then they changed from calling it EDS type three to HEDS or hypermobile EDS.
So are you hypermobile based on your Baten score? If so, then now there's 12 different points and you need to get at least five of those. Again, the 12 points that they chose were are ultimately arbitrary and the number five as the cutoff is arbitrary. Is your skin abnormally stretchy? Is your skin abnormally soft? Again, not very scientific because there aren't, this is all sort of, again, up to the uh, interpretation of the person doing the assessment. Are there certain types of scarring that happen? Are there stretch marks that happen before any pregnancies are not related to weight changes? Is the palate sort of in your mouth high, higher arch than normal? Are there certain uh, heart issues like a mitral valve prolapse? Um, are the fingers longer than normal? Are the arms longer than they should be with relation to the height? Uh, and again, there's 12 different points. So if you get five points, six points, five or more points, then you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome by, by and large. Um, if you have four points or less, then you don't. So it's very, it's very arbitrary. And that, that's the long and the short of it. I mentioned that there were three components. The third component is, is there a family history? So if you've got a sibling or a parent, so-called first degree relative, a child who has who does meet the full criteria for EDS, then you get credit for that. And then you would be said to have EDS. So it's kind of weird. So like if you come into my office and you have a seven on your bait and scale, you're hypermobile, you have four points of those 12 possible points, then technically you have hypermobility spectrum disorder, generalized hypermobility spectrum disorder. If you came that day to your office, not by yourself, but brought your sister and I looked at your sister and she had six, she had a bait and scale that met criteria for hypermobility. She had symptoms and she had six points on out of those 12, she would meet criteria for hypermobile EDS and therefore you would meet criteria. So again, you can see the sort of artificial and sort of logistical nature of how these criteria get made. Um, the other component is, you know, are there other, make sure there's not other conditions that can mimic it. In my experience, that's, that's very uncommon. And it really comes down to, again, is somebody hypermobile. So there's problems in both of the two major criteria. Again, one, the arbitrary nature of those 12 points and the bait and score itself. Some of the most hypermobile patients I've come across who have EDS, their bait and score may be just three. They're on, you know, their, their spine may be hypermobile, their neck, they may be hypermobile in ways that the bait and scale doesn't capture. Men, by and large, tend to have lower bait and scales than women, so it can be harder for them to get diagnosed. And then if you show up in my office when you're 40 versus 20, even that can be hard. Some people can be hypermobile, you know, up until their 80s throughout their life, but some, we definitely will observe that even age 30, 40 or older, um, people who may have had a higher bait and score don't. So it, it, they're flawed criteria. Um, you know, those of us who, who are really involved with EDS and hypermobility uh, do and need to take a more nuanced view. And unfortunately, the current criteria don't take into account what we call comorbidity. So what we realize is, um, you know, most people with hypermobility disorders, so EDS or HSD, um, or high percentage at least, will have things like POTS or other problems with their autonomic nervous system. They'll have digestive issues. They'll have something potentially called mast cell activation syndrome. They may be predisposed to structural problems like uh, cranial cervical instability, CCI or Chiari. We'll be talking about that because there are a lot of questions about those. So hopefully, and not too distant future, one or both of a couple of valuable things will happen. One is we'll have criteria that sort of take a broader view and, and look at these comorbidities. Obviously, it'd be great if we had genetic tests for hypermobile EDS. Nobody's sure why, despite HEDS being the most common form, why nobody as of yet has been able to identify a gene. There's um, a researcher in South Carolina who, who says that he's identified one and we're hoping that soon, uh, you know, his work will be, will be published in the medical literature and we'll learn more about that. Even so, I assume that's just going to be a subset of all the hypermobile EDS, but hopefully 
we'll have more tests available.